Good morning, you guys. Welcome to day four of Reading Tuesdays with Maury. Just a reminder that while we are reading this, you should also be working on section number one, which is a letter to your freshman self. When you are done with it, you should be adding it to your folder that you created. Um, I'll walk you through, you, through that uh, in a separate video, but for now, just create a separate folder and every time you have an assignment for this binder, you're going to drop it into that folder. All right, picking up on page 62, we start with the third Tuesday, we talk about regrets. The next Tuesday, I arrived with the normal bags of food, pasta with corn, potato salad, apple cobbler, and something else, a Sony tape recorder. I want to remember what we talk about, I told Maury. I want to have your voice so I can listen to it, Later. When I'm dead. Don't say that. He laughed. Mitch, I'm going to die. And sooner, not later. He regarded the new machine. So big, he said. I felt intrusive, as reporters often do, and I began to think that a tape machine between two people who were supposedly friends was a foreign object, an artificial ear. With all the people clamoring for his time, perhaps I was trying to take too much away from these Tuesdays. Listen, I said, picking up the recorder, we don't have to use this. If it makes you uncomfortable, he stopped me, wagged a finger, then hooked his glasses off his nose, letting them dangle on the string around his neck. He looked me square in the eye. Put it down, he said. I put it down. Mitch, he continued softly now, you don't understand. I want to tell you about my life. I want to tell you before I can't tell you any more. His voice dropped to a whisper. I want someone to hear my story. Will you? I nodded. We sat quietly for a moment. So, he said, is it turned on? Now the truth is that tape recorder was more than nostalgia. I was losing Maury. We were all losing Maury. His family, his friends, his ex-students, his fellow professors, his pals from the political discussion groups that he loved so much, his former dance partners, all of us. And I suppose tapes, like photographs and videos, are a desperate attempt to steal something from death's suitcase. But it was also becoming clear to me, through his courage, his humor, his patience, and his openness, that Maury was lo looking at life from some very different place than anyone else I knew, a healthier place, a more sensible place, and he was about to die. If some mystical clarity of thought came <clears throat> when you look at death in the eye, then I knew Maury wanted to share it, and I wanted to remember it for as long as I could. The first time I saw Maury on Nightline, I wondered what regrets he had once he knew his death was imminent. Did he lament lost friends? Would he have done much differently? Selfishly, I wondered if I were in his shoes, would I be consumed with sad thoughts of all that I had missed? Would I regret the secrets I kept hidden? When I mentioned this to Maury, he nodded. It's what everyone worries about, isn't it? What if today were my last day on earth? He studied my face and perhaps visions of me kneeling over my, keeling over my desk one day, halfway through a story, my editor snatching the copy even as the medics carried my body away. Mitch, Maury said. I shook my head and said nothing, but Maury picked up on my hesitation. Mitch, he said, the culture doesn't encourage you to think about such things until you're about to die. We're so wrapped up with egotistical things, career, family, having enough money, meeting the mortgage, getting a new car, fixing the radiator when it breaks. We're involved in trillions of little acts just to keep going. So we don't get into the habit of standing back and looking at our lives and saying, is this all? Is this all I want? Is something missing? He paused. You need someone to probe you in that direction. It won't just happen automatically. I knew what he was saying. We all need teachers in our lives. And mine was sitting in front of me. Fine, I figured. If I was to be the student, then I would be as good a student as I could be. On the plane ride home that day, I made a small list on a yellow legal pad, issues and questions that we all grapple with, from happiness to aging to having children to death. Of course, there were a million self-help books on, on these subjects and plenty of cable TV shows and $90 per hour consultation sessions. America had become a Persian bazaar of self-help, but there still seemed to be no clear answers. Do you take care of others or take care of your inner child? Return to traditional values or reject, tra reject tradition as useless? Seek success or seek simplicity? Just say no or just do it? 
All I knew was this. Maury, my old professor, wasn't in the self-help business. He was standing on the tracks, listening to death's locomotive whistle, and he was very clear about the important things in life. I wanted that clarity. Every confused and tortured soul I knew wanted that clarity. Ask me anything, Maury always said. So I wrote this list. Death, fear, aging, greed, marriage, family, society, forgiveness, a meaningful life. The list was in my bag when I returned to West Newton for the fourth time, a Tuesday in late August when the air conditioning at the Logan Airport terminal was not working and people fanned themselves and wiped sweat angrily from their foreheads and every face I saw looked ready to kill somebody. <clears throat> By the start of my senior year, I have taken so many sociology classes, I am only a few credits shy of a degree. Maury suggests I try an honors thesis. Me? I ask. What would I write about? What interests you? He says. We bat it back and forth until we finally settle on, of all things, sports. I begin a year-long project on how football in America has become ritualistic, almost a religion, an opiate for the masses. I have no idea that this is training for my future career. I only know it gives me another once-a-week session with Maury. And with his help, by spring, I have a 112-page thesis, researched, footnoted, documented, and neatly bound in black leather. I show it to Maury with the pride of a little leaguer rounding the bases on his first home run. Congratulations, Maury says. I grin as he leafs through it, and I glance around his office, the shelves of books, the hardwood floor, the throw rug, the couch. I think to myself that I have sat just about everywhere there is to sit in this room. I don't know, Mitch, Maury muses, adjusting his glasses as he reads. With work like this, we may have to get you back here for grad school. Yeah, right, I say. I snicker, but the idea is momentarily appealing. Part of me is scared of leaving school. Part of me wants to go desperately. Tension of opposites. I watch Maury as he reads my thesis and wonder what the big world will be like out there. The audiovisual part two. The Nightline show had done a follow-up story on Maury, partly because the reception for the first show had been so, so strong. This time, when the cameraman and producers came through the door, they already felt like family, and Capel himself was noticeably warmer. There was no feeling out process, no interview before the interview. As warm-up, Capel and Maury exchanged stories about their childhood backgrounds. Capel spoke of growing up in England, and Maury spoke of growing up in the Bronx. Maury wore a long-sleeved blue shirt. He was almost always chilly, even when it was 90 degrees outside. But Capel removed his jacket and did the interview in, his, in shirt and tie. It was as if Maury was breaking him down one layer at a time. You look fine, Capel said when the tape began to roll. That's what everybody tells me, Maury said. You sound fine. That's what everybody tells me. So how do you know things are going downhill? Maury sighed. Nobody can know it but me, Ted, but I know it. And as he spoke, it became obvious. He was not waving his hands to make a point as freely as he had in their first conversation. He had trouble pronouncing certain words. The L sound came, seemed to get caught in his throat. In a few more months, he might no longer speak at all. Here's how my emotions go, Maury told Capel. When I have people and friends here, I'm very up. The loving relationships maintain me. But there are days when I am depressed. Let me not deceive you. I see certain things going and I feel a sense of dread. What am I going to do without my hands? What happens when I can't speak? Swallowing, I don't care so much about. So they feed me through a tube, so what? But my voice, my hands, they're such an essential part of me. I talk with my voice, I gesture with my hands. This is how I give to people. How will you give when you can no longer speak? Capel asked. Maury shrugged. Maybe I'll have everyone ask me yes or no questions. It was such a simple answer that Capel had to smile. He asked Maury about silence. He mentioned a dear friend Maury had, Maury Stein, who had first sent Maury's aphorisms to the Boston Globe. They had been together at Brandis since the early 60s. Now Stein was going deaf. Capel imagined the two men together one day, one unable to speak, the other unable to hear. What would that be like? We will hold hands, Maury said, and there will be a lot of love passing between us. Ted, we've had 35 years of friendship. You don't need speech or hearing to feel that. 
Before the show ended, Maury read Capel one of the letters he'd received. Since the first Nightline program, there had been a great deal of mail. One particular letter came from a school teacher in Pennsylvania who taught a special class of nine children. Every child in the class had suffered the death of a parent. Here's what I sent her back, Maury told Capel, perching his glasses gingerly on his nose and ears. <clears throat> Dear Barbara, I was very moved by your letter. I feel the work you have done with the children who have lost a parent is very important. I also lost a parent at an early age. Suddenly, with the camera still humming, Maury adjusted the glasses. He stopped, bit his lip, and began to choke up. Tears fell down his nose. I lost my mother when I was a child, and it was quite a blow to me. I wish I'd had a group like yours where I would be, have been able to talk about my sorrows. I would have joined this, your group because, his voice cracked, because I was so lonely. Maury, Capel said, that was 70 years ago your mother died. The pain still goes on? You bet, Maury whispered. The professor he was eight years old. A telegram came from the hospital, and since his father, a Russian immigrant, could not read English, Maury had to break the news, reading his mother's death notice like a student in front of the, cl of the class. We regret to inform you, he began. On the morning of the funeral, Maury's relatives came down the steps of his tenement building on the poor Lower East Side of Manhattan. The men wore dark suits, the women wore veils. The kids in the neighborhood were going off to school, and as they passed, Maury looked, looked down, ashamed that his classmates would see him this way. One of his aunts, a heavyset woman, grabbed Maury and began to wail. What will you do without your mother? What will become of you? Maury burst into tears. His classmates ran away. At the cemetery, Maury watched as they shoveled dirt into his mother's grave. He tried to recall the tender moments they had shared when she was alive. She had operated a candy store until she got sick, after which she mostly slept or sat by the window, looking frail and weak. Sometimes she would yell out for her son to get her some medicine, and young Maury, playing kick stickball in the street, would pretend he did not hear her. In his mind, he believed he could make the illness go away by ignoring it. How else can a child confront death? Maury's father, whom everyone called Charlie, had come to America to escape the Russian army. He worked in the fur business, but was constantly out of a job. Uneducated and barely able to speak English, he was terribly poor, and the family was on public assistance much of the time. Their apartment was a dark, cramped, depressing place behind the candy store. They had no luxuries, no car. Sometimes to make money, Maury and his younger brother David would wash porch steps together for a nickel. After their mother's death, the two boys were sent off to a small hotel in the Connecticut woods where several families shared a large cabin in a communal kitchen. The fresh air might be good for the children, the relatives thought. Maury and David had never seen so much greenery, and they ran and played in the fields. One night after dinner, they went for a walk and it began to rain. Rather than come inside, they splashed around for hours. The next morning, when they awoke, Maury hopped out of bed. Come on, he said to his brother, get up! I can't. What do you mean? David's face was panicked. I can't move. He had polio. Of course, the rain did not cause this, but a child Maury's age could not understand that. For a long time, as his brother was taken back and forth to a special medical home and was forced to wear braces on his legs, which left him limping, Maury felt responsible. So in the mornings, he went to synagogue by himself because his father was not a religious man, and he stood among the swaying men in their long black coats, and he asked God to take care of his dead mother and his sick brother. And in the afternoons, he stood at the bottom of the subway steps and hawked magazines, turning whatever money he made over to his family to buy food. In the evenings, he watched his father eat in silence, hoping for, but never getting, a show of affection, communication, warmth. At nine years old, he felt as if the weight of a mountain were on his shoulders. But a saving em embrace came into Maury's life the following year, his new stepmother, Eva. She was a short Romanian immigrant with plain features, curly brown hair, and the energy of two women. She had a glow that warmed the otherwise murky atmosphere his father created. She talked when her new husband was silent. She sang songs to the children at night. Maury took comfort in her soothing voice, her school lessons, her, st her strong character. When his brother returned from the medical home, still wearing leg braces from the polio, the two of them shared a rollaway bed in the kitchen of their apartment, and Eva would kiss them goodnight. 
Maury waited on those kisses like a puppy waits on milk, and he felt deep down that he had a mother again. There was no escaping their poverty, however. They lived now in the Bronx in a one-bedroom apartment in a red brick building on Tremont Avenue next to an Italian beer garden where the old men played bocce on summer evenings. Because of the Depression, Maury's father found even less work in the fur business. Sometimes when the family sat at the dinner table, all Eva could put out was bread. What else is there? David would ask. Nothing else, she would answer. When she tucked Maury and David into bed, she would sing to them in Yiddish. Even the songs were sad and poor. There was one about a girl trying to sell her cigarettes. Please buy my cigarettes. They are dry, not wet by rain. Take pity on me. Take pity on me. Still, despite their circumstances, Maury was taught to love and to care and to learn. Eva would accept nothing less than excellence in school because she saw education as the only antidote to their poverty. She herself went to night school to improve her English. Maury's love for education was hatched in her arms. He studied at night by the lamp at the kitchen table, and in the mornings he would go to synagogue to say yes kor, the memorial prayer for the dead, for his mother. He did this to keep her memory alive. Incredibly, Maury had been told by his father never to talk about her. Charlie wanted young David to think Eva was his natural mother. It was a terrible burden to Maury. For years, the only evidence Maury had of his mother was the telegram announcing her death. He had hidden it the day it arrived. He would keep it the rest of his life. When Maury was a teenager, his father took him to a fur factory where he worked. This was during the Depression. The idea was to get Maury a job. He entered the factory and immediately felt as if the walls had closed in around him. The room was dark and hot. The windows covered with filth and the machines were packed tightly together, churning like train wheels. The fur hairs were flying, creating a thickened air. And the workers sewing the pelts together were bent over their needles as the boss marched up and down the row, screaming for them to go faster. Maury could barely breathe. He stood next to his father, frozen with fear, hoping the boss wouldn't scream at him too. During lunch break, his father took Maury to the boss and pushed him in, fr in front of him, asking if there was any work for his son. But there was barely enough work for the adult laborers, and no one was giving it up. This, for Maury, was a blessing. He hated that place. <clears throat> he made another vow that he kept to the end of his life. He would never do any work that exploited someone else, and he would never allow himself to make money off the sweat of others. What will you do? Eva would ask him. I don't know, he would say. He ruled out law because he didn't like lawyers, and he ruled out medicine because he couldn't take the side of blood. What will you do? It was only through default that the best professor I ever had became a teacher. A teacher affects eternity. He can never tell where his influence stops. Henry Adams. All right, we will end there. Sorry for all the noise. Bruce just turned on the uh, Roomba vacuum cleaner. So I apologize for that. Um, but I hope that you guys are enjoying the book so far and make sure you are working on section number one.